Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Dear friends, good morning. I'm very happy to join you today from Washington, D.C. We have our first physical IMF meetings. We are exactly one year after my previous intervention in this forum, and I definitely see a change for the better in the economic climate in Europe. Europe, Europe is now the most vaccinated continent in the world. Economic growth in the euro area has so far been stronger than expected. And according to our latest forecast, real GDP is expected to exceed its pre-COVID level by the end of this year. If anything, we can perhaps say that uncertainty has shifted a little from the growth outlook to the inflation outlook, but I will come back to this point later. Uh, my speech today will address three interconnected issues. First, what are the key changes following the ECB strategy review? which was concluded, as you know, last July. Second, where do we stand on inflation, the theme of the day? And third, some perspectives on the ECB's monetary policy up to and after the end of the COVID crisis. Let me start with the ECB monetary strategy review. Uh, the unanimous adoption last July of the new monetary policy strategy was a very important achievement for the euro system. And let me pay tribute for that to President Christine Lagarde and sum up our review, perhaps in three key messages, and I will not enter into technical detail. First, the ECB has become a clearer and more credible inflation target. And you know there was an ancient debate about that. After the clarification of our 2% inflation target, which is now both symmetric and medium term, as I advocated here precisely one year ago. To anchor inflation expectations, it is important to have symmetry built into the strategy so that our 2% inflation target is no longer perceived as a ceiling. And medium term, our objective is also forward-looking to help guide inflation expectations, but it does not ignore the past either. In this context, our new forward guidance announced in July plays a crucial role as it should reinforce the ECB's credibility. By incorporating conditionality on both inflation forecast and underlying inflation outcomes, relative to our 2% target, this forward guidance allows us to maintain strong and persistent monetary policy action going beyond transitory inflationary effects. This is obviously particularly relevant at present, as I will elaborate on later. Second message on our strategic review, the ECB is a pioneer among central banks in the fight against climate change. We have acknowledged that climate change directly affects our primary mandate of price stability. And climate-related fi financial risks are becoming first order, not only for banks and interest, but also for our own balance sheet and it can no longer be overlooked. Hence, the Governing Council has agreed on a comprehensive climate action plan that commits to further incorporating climate change considerations into our monetary policy operations as early as 24, and let me also stress this calendar, which is ambitious, and to expand our analytical modeling and statistical tools with regard to climate change. Uh, let me say that the Banque de France played a central role in setting this agenda, notably through the creation of the now famous NGFS network for greening the financial system and its global secretariat, RIRA. 
Third message about the strategy review, the ECB also intends to step up its communication. This has perhaps been less noticed, but as I often stress, communication is fundamental not only for democratic accountability, but for economic efficacy and for the transmission of monetary policy to all economic agents, including households and firms. If they are better informed, they will make better economic decisions. Our inflation targeting policy will be much more effective if economic agents understand it, adhere to it, and believe in it, thus helping to better anchor inflation expectations. To this aim, the first step is our new monetary policy statement, which I don't know if you read it in detail, but without any doubt, it's shorter and it provides a clearer narrative of why we took our monetary policy decisions. But since effective speaking also means active listening, the Banque de France organized 17 listening events this year, both at national and regional levels. And we reached out more than 300,000 French citizens, which is a quite impressive figure. We discussed our mandate, the principles of monetary policy, and the effect of monetary policy very concretely on their daily lives. I have decided to make this an annual event in the future. Let me now come to my second point, the economic outlook and the future course of inflation. The robust euro area recovery has been helped by a successful combination of accommodative monetary and fiscal policies, both at national and EU levels. Inflation has also rebounded quite strongly with the figures you know, headline inflation at 3.4% in September, according to the flash estimate, and core inflation at 1.9%. This rebound obviously fuels lively public debate. But we should be vigilant without being feverish. Clearly, there is no such thing as stagflation. This rebound results mainly from several temporary factors, as already stressed by my ECB colleagues, Philip Lane and Isabel Schnabel, I am sure that Philip, who participates later in the panel, will come back to that later. Part of the rebound just offsets exceptionally low prices during last year COVID crisis. Compared to September 2019, consumption prices have only increased by 1.5% on an annual basis and prices excluding energy and food by only 1.0%. A second cause can be attributed to the strong rebound of energy prices, in particular oil and natural gas, the latter having also a direct impact on wholesale electricity prices. It is, of course, very hard to forecast prices, but future markets for natural gas are currently pricing a sharp decrease in the second quarter of 22. The third cause is the global shift from the consumption of services to the consumption of goods. Supply chains are struggling to serve this demand. But our central view remains that this third cause will fade out over the coming quarters even if the exact timing is uncertain. Some prices, such as those of timber or ferrous metals, have already passed their peak and are falling sharply. But as tensions remain acute in shipping or semiconductors, we cannot rule out that supply-side bottlenecks will push out the date at which inflation starts to come back to its trend. Nevertheless, we see few signs of general wage increases in line with subdued services inflation. Moderate wage increase in the URAR 
in some sectors of the economy could be warranted to make jobs more attractive and reduce labor shortages. But there are few signs, let me repeat it, of a wage price spiral at the current juncture. Indicators of long-term inflation expectations of professionals, both market-based and survey-based, have picked up, but remain below our 2% target. According to the ECB staff latest macroeconomic projections of September, URA inflation would decrease to 1.5% in 23. Some may question this latter figure and call it too conservative, but let me take a very practical approach here. There might be some upside risks by a few decimal points on our 23 forecast. But, but what matters for monetary policy is the distance of realized inflation, not from our forecast, but from our target of 2%. And from this point of view, it is clear that the risk remains that we fall short of our inflation target in 2023, rather than exceed it. This calls for a continued accommodative monetary policy. But we are vigilant, as I said, we are carefully monitoring inflation developments. If ever, if ever inflationary pressures should turn out to be long lasting, we would have the means and the willingness to anchor inflation at 2% in the medium term. This brings me to the third and last part of my speech about the use of our instruments consistent with the new strategy, my first part, and the inflation outlook, my previous part. Let me remind that some of our instruments were designed to be temporary from the start and to respond to specific risks associated with the pandemic, such as our famous PEP. The governing council will probably decide on the future of its monetary policy instruments in December. So we have significant time left to monitor economic and financial data. And one shouldn't give too much credit to rumors and speculations floating at present, including on an allegedly earlier calendar of ECB rate hikes. However, I would like today to dispel some misperceptions, possible misperceptions, about how instruments might evolve, and to mention some of the lessons I tend to draw from our successful crisis management. Let me start by recalling that the transition out of the PEP itself is different from our other instruments because it is conditioned on the end of the coronavirus crisis rather than on the inflation outlook, which guides our other instruments. If the governing council judges, I quote, that the coronavirus crisis phase is over, unquote, then net purchases under PEP will end by March 22. As things stand today, this is likely to happen. It is important, therefore, to stress that exiting from PEP would not signal the end of our very accommodative monetary policy. Monetary policy will continue, without any doubt, to provide accommodation through our quartet of tools namely asset purchases and stocks, long-term liquidity provision, negative interest rates, and forward guidance. Let, let me stress one thing, which has perhaps been less noted. These four tools have been durably established by the new, new strategy. It's a paragraph eight of our statement. And so we should probably start calling them the new conventional instruments, rather, than non-conventional ones. Let me now share some more specific thoughts 
on the successes of our two crisis instruments, PEP and TLT03, and how these lessons might influence our future reflections on our quartet. Let me start with the lessons from the PEP. The PEP has been instrumental in the EU area since the start of the COVID crisis, thanks to its dual role. What do I mean through its dual role? The PEP affected the stance and the transmission of monetary policy. It put an end to the turmoil in the financial market during spring last year. And since then, it has ensured favorable financing conditions for both public and private borrowers. We can draw two main lessons from the PEP's achievement with regard to asset purchases. Stock methods and flexibility methods. Let me start with the first lesson. The financial literature suggests that it is changes in the anticipated stock of assets that exert a downward pressure on long-term interest rates through a decrease in term premium. This effect tends to wear off over time as the securities portfolio held by the central bank ages. Thus, our future PEP reinvestment policy which was perhaps less often mentioned. Our future PEP reinvestment policy will be key to continuing to provide an accommodative monetary stance even after the end of the net purchase phase. Second lesson, the PEP's flexibility, both across asset classes and among jurisdictions, is a powerful and innovative way to achieve the adequate transmission of our monetary policy. This allows us to intervene more effectively in specific market segments when it is most needed and to prevent unwarranted fragmentation in the euro area, such as, remember, during the March 2020 turbulence. Such conditions may, of course, arise again in the future, irrespective of the context of the COVID pandemic. Therefore, according to me, it could be worth examining if and how at least some elements of this PEP flexibility should be kept in our virtual toolbox. Their mere existence, the theoretical possibility of their use would mean that we would probably not have to actually use them. This is what I call the virtual toolbox. An additional key feature of the PEP was to announce a total envelope of potential purchases, also incorporating a flexibility regarding the timing of purchases within this total envelope. By contrast, the APP is currently operating with an open-ended flow of 20 billion euro of additional net purchases per month. The APP might benefit still more than from increased fixed volumes from adding some forms of such flexibility of purchases over time. Last but not least, in July, the Governing Council updated its forward guidance on interest rates to bring it into line with the new definition of price stability. We agreed to reflect later, that is to say December, on whether to adjust our forward guidance on the APP. Let me come and conclude with the lessons of our other crisis instruments, TL03, and link it to the two tier system. Uh, the third round of targeted long term refinancing operations, TL03, has proved to be a powerful tool during the COVID crisis to avoid a credit crunch to the private sector. 
As the euro area financial system is mainly bank based, our future actions must continue to support bank lending to businesses, including SMEs, and households as the recovery evolves. I am therefore in favor of, of keeping this funding instrument as a liquidity backstop in some form in the future. Also to avoid possible cliff effects related to future repayments. However, I think that a careful recalibration of its pricing is required. Now that the recovery is well underway, the generous pricing of TL03 lending rates can be up to 50 basis points below the average deposit facility rate since April 2020. This generous pricing is no longer justified. The present calibration of TLT rule pricing clearly provides riskless arbitrage opportunities for banks. Having said that, I am fully aware of the fact that the negative interest rates on excess liquidity holdings may affect the profitability of bank intermediation in the long run, since they are primarily funded by their clients' deposits and affecting profitability of banks, affecting, consequently, the right transmission of our monetary policy. I hence strongly advocated the introduction of the two-tier system in September 2019, which aims to exempt part of credit institutions' excess liquidity holdings from the cost of the negative deposit facility rates. This has been without any doubt, a success in limiting the negative side effects on bank intermediation of low for long interest rates, thereby preserving the adequate transmission of monetary policy. As you know, the exemption volume is determined as a multiplier of banks' minimum reserve requirements. And this multiplier is currently set at six. Let us look for one minute more precisely at figures. When the two-tier system was introduced in October 2019, total excess liquidity was just above 1.7 trillion euros. As a result of the ECB response to the COVID pandemic, total excess liquidity has now jumped to 4.4 trillion euros an amount well above the level of reserve necessary to steer market rates towards the deposit facility rate. This level of reserve, what we call the FREL, floor required excess liquidity, is currently estimated at about 1 trillion euro. Consequently, I would support a more rule-based approach to set the level of the multiplier. It could be a function of the change in excess liquidity net of both necessary and borrowed reserve, necessary being frail, borrowed being TLT road. Much more than subsidizing liquidity provision beyond exceptional circumstances like in the last two years, a well calibrated tiering system belongs to the normal tools of monetary policy as shown by other jurisdictions. Let me conclude and sum up. We sometimes read that central banks, including the ECB, are presently squeezed by two dilemmas. The first one being on the objectives, as central banks would have either to accept excessive inflation or to threaten the recovery. And the second dilemma would be on the instrument, as they would take the risk of cliff edge effects by exiting the COVID crisis instrument. These two views are largely wrong, according to me, and I try to explain why in the case of the ECB. First, on our objectives. Based on the successful conclusion of our strategic review and forward guidance, we can be patient 
in navigating through a significant but temporary surge of inflation. And second on our instruments, we have beyond that a broad spectrum of possibilities to further run an accommodative monetary policy, thanks to our quartet of non-conventional or rather new conventional instruments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francois, for this wonderful speech. Um, we have some time for uh, Q&A because uh, the next uh, keynote speech uh, is recorded. Uh, so uh, we have a very strict uh, time schedule and that allows uh, that we have time until uh, uh, some uh, more minutes. So um, I already uh, saw that there were several questions uh, in the chat. Um, I think the most efficient uh, way to go forward is that uh, either I ask the question uh, if someone prefers not to uh, have his or her name mentioned, and otherwise I'll give the floor uh, to uh, a person. Um, first of all, uh, one of the questions that uh, was raised uh, was the following. In your presentation, uh, which, by the way, was very clear, which I appreciated very much. Um, you said that um, probably in December, uh, the governing council will decide uh, about uh, the future of uh, PEP. Um, and the key thing, of course, to decide is whether or not the COVID-19 pandemic is over. Um, I've heard many politicians, uh, both in my own country and abroad, uh, claiming that the COVID-19 pandemic was over. And every time and again, uh, they had to uh, come back to those words, because, as we all know, uh, it's not over yet. Uh, even though the situation is much, much better than, uh, say, a year ago, um, you know, on a daily basis in my country, we still have more than uh, 2000 new infected uh, people every day. And there's still some 200 people uh, in the uh, intensive care units of the hospitals. Um, and I guess that will only be uh, more in all likelihood in, in December. So how um, will the governing council decide on, on whether um, the, the, the COVID pandemic crisis is over? Uh, because it can't be a, a black or white uh, situation probably. So can you enlighten us a bit more on, on how you will decide on this issue? So, uh, Jacob, first, thank you for your kind words on my speech and its clarity. And as you know, it's always the point when you try to have a clear and complete speech, it's quite difficult to add something in answer, which you will understand. Uh, but let me only stress two things, perhaps, on your question. First, what I wanted to stress is the calendar, because uh, we all remember how strong the pressure has been on the calendar of our decision. And from last spring, to be honest. So we clearly say that we don't have to rush. And I insisted today also on the fact that we will judge probably by December. Uh, but probably we are free. Uh, and we will judge using all the economic and financial data available at this point. So we have time left. And this is very important because I still see many rumors, et cetera, of uh, people, markets, ECB observers would like to know, but this calendar is the right one. And I think President Lagarde is obviously uh, accurate, determined, to follow this calendar. Second, on the substance, uh, we don't have to judge the health situation. As I stressed, and it could be a pride for us as Europeans, Europe is now the most vaccinated continent worldwide. And remember the situation at the start of this year, February or March 21, there was so much criticism against the European Commission, saying, you are late, you are behind the curve, look at UK, look at the US, look elsewhere. We are now the most vaccinated continent worldwide, and this has deep economic and also uh, social consequences, 
uh, I happen to be in the US today, really the footprint even psychologically of Delta is much stronger in other jurisdictions than in the URA because we are more vaccinated. Having said that, what we have to judge, we governing council, is the economic, financial, and monetary side of the story. Where are we on the economic and financial consequences of uh, COVID? And is the economic crisis phase over? Probably this decision on the economic side is a bit simpler than the sanitary one, also due to the fact that we learned collectively how to live with the virus, how to work and produce while protecting ourselves. So uh, each new wave, and possibly there could be new waves, has less and less economic consequences. But having said that, let us wait, wait, wait and see in December. We don't have to, to rush. Again, we will make better decisions if they are more informed by the latest economic data. Thank you very much. Um, Elga Barch has a question to you. Please, Elga. Thank you very much. And uh, I would also echo what Jakob just said. Um, very uh, pertinent and very interesting and clear remarks. And I do very much share your assessment that we are not seeing uh, stagflation, that we should be looking through the current um, spike in inflation. But I'm also wondering, because we can see some other central banks, I'm sort of speaking to you from London, um, getting nervous uh, around um, some of these supply bottlenecks, which are driven by the uh, activity restart. But what would change this assessment? Is it the second round effects, inflation expectations, and also in the future, might we actually face a higher frequency of supply shocks and supply bottlenecks than we have seen in the past due to a number of secular changes that we're seeing in the global economy, including the one that we want to facilitate, which is the move towards a low carbon economy. Thank you. Uh, Elga, again, thanks for your kind words. Uh, first obvious remark, each jurisdiction is domestically driven. And this is very important. We have to look at our own data. The situation might be different in the UK or elsewhere or in some emerging economy. And we have to look mainly at the inflation outlook. This remains our forward guidance. This remains our primary uh, role and anchor. Uh, so having said that, what do we look at? First, we look at the evolution of bottlenecks. Uh, and there are very good reasons to think that they are temporary. We have some uncertainty about the height uh, of this temporary phenomenon, about its length. But uh, a temporary surge does not mean a long standing trend. And this is very important for us. So we have no reasons at this stage to think that things change. Uh, and second, we look whether there could be what you mentioned, which is to mean a, a loop between prices and wages. Frankly, we don't see such signs today. And the best proof for that in the URR is, is that if you look at services inflation, it remains more or less what it used to be. We had this decrease last year due to the COVID recession. We have an increase this year. But the long trend, there are no bottlenecks, uh, and, and the long trend is very stable and, and, and in continuity. So I said that we should be vigilant without being feverish, and this is exactly what I mean. Uh, I, I could say it with also some more physiological images. We should have open eyes, obviously, but we should keep cool air. And I think this is, this is what we are doing. Having said that, I added that if ever, but I stress the ever, inflationary pressure should turn out to be long lasting, we would have the means and the willingness to anchor inflation expectation. But this is not uh, by far the most possible scenario. Because uh, we all know there are two possible mistakes in monetary policy. The first is to react 
exaggeratedly too early to temporary phenomenon and hence strengthening the recovery. And the second risk would be to not to see a long lasting phenomenon. At present, without any doubt, the first risk is more significant than the second one. Thank you very much. Um, if you allow, I would also like to ask you a question. Uh, in your presentation, we, you... we are beyond time, Jacob. Now, no, 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 no. We have <laughs> until nineteen past two. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, let us agree it's the last one, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's agree on that. Um, in your presentation, you also stressed uh, communication, um, and that's a topic that uh, I worked on quite extensively. Uh, together with several uh, co-authors, including uh, my good friend Alan Blinder. And Alan Blinder is uh, very uh, skeptic about, uh, you know, the possibilities uh, to reach the general audience. Um, there's a lot of research suggesting that financial markets respond to central bank communication and generally, uh, indeed, in the intended direction. Um, and that, of course, is because financial markets listen. They have an interest to listen to the uh, central banks. Um, and Alan Blinder has argued that uh, the situation for the general public is very different in this respect. They don't have an interest um, to listen. Uh, and in fact, this is also confirmed by my own research. Uh, when we surveyed uh, the Dutch uh, public, uh, we asked them, okay, how much uh, are you interested in what the ECB uh, is doing? Um, and we were very disappointed by the outcome because uh, many, many respondents uh, indicated, you know, they don't have uh, a clear interest. They don't listen. Um, and you can speak out, you can speak out clearly, you can speak out simply, uh, you can use different means, but if people are not interested, um, they will not listen. So how will the ECB tackle this, this issue? Um, because I think it's a fundamental issue, especially if you, you know, refer to uh, central bank accountability, um, then I think it's important to uh, involve the general public. Um, but they don't seem to be interested. Uh, Jacob, I think, as you do, that it's a, a very important question. But let me say why I am slightly more optimistic and speak from the Banque de France perspective. By the way, in the euro system, it's a topic where the NCBs have a very important role to play due also to language expression. Uh, I agree with you on one point, and then I will be more optimistic. When you tell to people the word monetary policy, you probably lose your audience because they are not excited in monetary policy. They don't know what it is. Uh, can I tell you a small family story? I happen to have five children who are normally educated, and five years ago, I tried to explain to them my job. So I prepared at family dinner a short statement, simpler than this morning, uh, about 10 to 15 minutes about monetary policy. And then my eldest daughter, who happens to be a doctor, a practitioner, uh, told me, and it, it was very kind from her, it was dad, it was very interesting, but next time do it more simple. So it was a good lesson for me. So we tried. Uh, and here, is, this is why I'm more optimistic. We organized these 17 events, we said in French, la Banque de France à votre écoute, Banque de France listens to you. It was during COVID, so we had no physical mo uh, meeting, it was between February and June of this year. So very adverse conditions. And believe me, Jacob, we were really surprised by the success of this event. I mentioned 300,000 French citizens participating, listening, asking questions. And what they told us was for us a very important message. They told us we are interested. So please tell us, but tell us differently. Tell us from our daily life what it means for us. If you speak technically of monetary policy, monetary policy instruments, we are not interested. If you speak about inflation, about the possible evolution of interest rates, for example, for mortgages, about financial stability, they don't use this word, but the evolution of prices, bubbles, inequalities. If you speak of what you can do on climate change, then we are extremely interested. 
So it's up to you, central banks, to start from our daily lives concretely and to explain what you can change and how things could evolve and what will be your rule of conduct. But if we do that, believe me, we will be listened. And especially this time where the debate about inflation has become so lively with some exaggerations that I mentioned, but I think communication is more important than ever. Thank you very much. Um, not only for your very uh, open uh, and very transparent uh, qu uh, response to our questions, but also for your wonderful speech. Um, it was a pleasure to listen uh, to you. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today.